Welcome to Read Ancient Languages. I'm Dr. Fausto Labruco. Today we will talk about the four oldest copies of the Christian Bible, the so-called four great codices. Codices is the plural of codex. A codex is the earliest form of book made of parchment and not of paper and handwritten in a characteristic style called onshal. Before we look at these four great codices, let's look at a timeline to put the history of the Bible in context. So the Christian Bible obviously contains the Old Testament and the New Testament. The books of the Old Testament are many and have been composed over several centuries, mainly between the 6th and the 3rd century BCE, although some of them come from a much older oral tradition. They were composed largely in Hebrew, although some books were probably originally in Aramean. Next on this timeline, we have the life of Jesus. Born approximately six to four years before the year zero, we don't know for sure, and then probably in the year 30. The year zero marks the transition between BCE and CE. Now, for what concerns the books of the New Testament, which were all written in ancient Greek, most people assume that the first books written were the Gospels and that they were written immediately after the life of Jesus. And this is wrong. The earliest books of the New Testament, in fact, are the Pauline letters, the letters of the Apostle Paul, which were composed between the year 50 and 60. Among the Gospels, the first Gospel written was Mark, at least 40 years after the death of Jesus. And this date is fairly certain because in the Gospel of Mark, there is a reference to the destruction of the Second Temple of Jerusalem by the Romans. The assumption is that the Matthew, Luke, and Acts, which draw from Mark, were written in the decade after Mark. For John, most scholars agree on a later date, largely because of the themes discussed in John and because of the Christology of John. That means the way the nature of Jesus is understood in John. I'm not going to go in the chronology of the other New Testament letters because we would have to discuss their authorship, which is highly controversial. But we can say that the core of the New Testament was composed well before the mid of the second century. The issue is that we do not have any original copy of these books. What we have is copies or copies or copies. For example, the earliest copy of a gospel is a papyrus containing the Gospel of John, dating from no earlier than the beginning of the third century. It's called the Bodmer Papyrus. And there's a video about this on, uh, on this channel. But when it comes to full copies of the Bible, including the entire Old Testament and the New Testament, the earliest existing copies are Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus from the early fourth century and Codex Alexandrinus and Codex Ephraemi Rescriptus from the mid-fifth century. So let's take a closer look at these four exceptional books, the four earliest copies of the Bible. First, and probably most ancient, the Codex Vaticanus, called name B in the biblical scholarship, kept at the Vatican Library in Rome. The origins of this codex are unknown. Second, Codex Sinaiticus, code name Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, kept at the British Library. This book was found in the 1800s at the monastery of St. Catherine in Egypt, on the Sinai Peninsula, by Constantine von Tischendorf, a giant of philology, a real ancient manuscript hunter. Third, Codex Alexandrinus, code name A, written in Alexandria, Egypt, has changed hands many times and now is kept at the British Library as well. Fourth, the Codex Ephraemi Rescriptus, code name C, also found by von Tischendorf. And this has an unusual history because it was recycled. The text of the Bible was erased and the pages were rewritten with texts in Ethiopic. Luckily, scholars were able to revive the erased text which was one of the most ancient Bibles in existence. And there is a video about this book as well on this channel. 
From a paleographic point of view, paleography is the study of ancient writings, what is common to those four ancient Bibles is the writing style. It is called Anshal, and uh, its uh, characteristic is that uh, the letters are all capital, and they are pretty much square, meaning they are as tall as broad, as you can see from this alpha, omicron, p, and sigma. And uh, this is with the exception of some letters, like uh, y, rho, or phi, which stretch above or below the line. Another characteristic is that these four ancient Bibles are written in scriptio continua, which means there are no spaces between the words. They are written in a continuous stream of letters. But besides the way they were written, these four ancient Bibles are not very similar to one another. In fact, they differ in the books they contain. Now, I'm not going to discuss the Old Testament, but regarding the New Testament in these four Bibles, there are different contents. The Codex Vaticanus lacks four of four letters. First and second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and it also lacks the book of Revelation, although it's not clear whether it is just missing or if it was never included. Interestingly, first and second Timothy and Titus, which are also known as the pastoral letters, today are considered almost certainly not written by Paul. Whereas Philemon is not disputed, it's almost certainly written by Paul. Codex Sinaiticus contains all the 27 books of the New Testament which you would find in a modern Bible. However, it also includes the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas, which is an apocalypse. Codex Alexandrinus and Codex Ephraemi Rescriptus, which were written almost 100 years later, contain the exact same 27 books, which are today recognized as the New Testament canon. So many people are surprised that different copies of the Bible may contain different books of the New Testament. Actually, in antiquity, the canon of the New Testament which means the books that the New Testament was supposed to contain, was not officially agreed upon. And different churches in different parts of the world adopted the different books in their canon of the New Testament. Let's take a quick look at the history of how the canon of the New Testament came about. The first attempt at putting together a series of books into a collection called the New Testament came in the second century from a man called Martian of Sinope. However, Martian had proposed that instead of adopting the four Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke and John, to adopt his own Gospel, which was largely a conflation of the three synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew and Luke. This canon, the canon proposed by Martian, never really gained any attraction. And Martian later was considered a heretic. The man you see in the picture, his name is Muratori, was exploring an ancient library in Milan, the Ambrosian Library, and he found an old manuscript, which was the copy of an even older manuscript from the late second century. In this manuscript, an unknown author gives an overview of the books which at his time were included in the canon of the New Testament. The list is quite similar to today's list of the New Testament books. However, it does not include some of the letters which we find in a modern New Testament, and it includes a second apocalyptic book beside the book of Revelation, and it's called the Apocalypse of Peter. Much later, in the year 367, a bishop of the city of Alexandria in Egypt, his name is Athanasius, he wrote a letter to his people, a pastoral letter to give the correct date of the Easter on that year, and he discussed which books should be included in the New Testament canon. And the list he gives corresponds exactly to the canon we use today. So it took 
over 300 years from the time the first books of the New Testament were written to the time they were formalized in a collection similar to the one we use today. However, this doesn't mean that all churches were in agreement with Athanasius. Many churches continue to use their own set of books for the New Testament, and a definitive officialization of the canon of the New Testament came only at the Council of Trent in the 16th century, over a thousand years after the first attempts at deciding the canon. So the differences between the four oldest copies of the Bible are in the books they contain, but even in the text of each book. And I'm not referring to small incidental changes of a few scattered words, perhaps due to mistakes in copying the manuscripts. I'm talking about the real and significant textual differences. There are many examples of this. One of the classic examples is the end of the Gospel of Mark. We just have to look at the end of the Gospel of Mark to realize how different the earliest copies of the Bible could be. The last chapter of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, contains eight verses in Codex Vaticanus and in Codex Sinaiticus, but it continues for another 12 verses in Codex Alexandrinus and in Codex Ephraim Rescriptus. This is a hugely controversial topic, so it needs a bit of context. We are at the end of the Gospel of Mark. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome are visiting the tomb of Jesus because they want to anoint the body of Jesus. They find the tomb open. The body of Jesus is not there and a young man in a white robe, presumably an angel, tells them that Jesus has risen and tells them, to the women, to go, to tell the Jesus disciples and to Peter that Jesus is going ahead of them into Galilee and that they will see him there just as he told them. But then on verse 8 of the Gospel of Mark chapter 16, the Gospel says, literally, so they went out quickly and fled from the tomb for they were shaken and amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And this, this last sentence, is the final sentence of the Gospel of Mark in Codex Vaticanus and in Codex Sinaiticus. The two Marys and Salome did not announce to the apostles or to Peter that Jesus had risen. They just flew in shock and did not tell anyone. If you want to see for yourselves, this is the final verse, verse 8, of the Gospel of Mark chapter 16 in Codex Vanicanus and in Codex Sinaiticus. This is the Greek text written. It reads, Kai udeni uden epon, ephubon to gar. Which means, and they did not tell anything to anyone, because they were afraid. Since the Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus are from the early 4th century, and uh, Codex Alexandrinus and Codex Ephraim Rescriptus uh, from a hundred years later, the most natural thing would be to think that the original mark ended with verse 8, when the women are afraid and do not tell anything to anyone, and sometimes during those hundred years, someone added another 12 verses to the end of Mark. The problem with this assumption is that we have evidence from some of the earliest church fathers, namely Justin Martyr, Irenaeus of Lyon and Tatian, who was a disciple of Justin, who cite the additional 12 verses of Mark. So there are basically two possibilities. One first possibility is that the original Mark of which we have no original copy, included those 12 final verses. And that those who wrote Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, for whatever reason, chose to omit them. And the second possibility is that Mark did actually finish with verse 8, with the women not telling anyone that Jesus was a reason. And that an unknown author added the extra 12 verses sometimes at the beginning of the second century.
This implies that the people who wrote Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus copied them from a very early version of Mark, a version from before this unknown author added the final 12 verses. Who knows, maybe even the original manuscript by Mark. Today, most scholars agree that the latter is the most plausible theory, largely based on linguistic analysis of the last 12 verses. So if you open a modern Bible, you will see at the end of Mark that the final 12 verses are defined as possibly spurious. So in this video, we have seen the history and the paleography of the four most ancient Bibles in existence, the four great codices, and we have seen how their contents differ because the canon of the New Testament wasn't decided until much later. And we also have seen how the text of the actual Gospels sometimes can have significant differences depending on which uh, tradition of manuscript we look at. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching and Read Ancient Languages. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for updates. Please visit our channel for other videos and don't forget to subscribe.